boy, I tell you, this Q building, I think, is going to be tougher than I thought. Hello, my name's Butch, Blackport Butch from New York. I've been at Deakman's University for two days now. So let me tell you, my head's spinning. Now before the game. Hello, my name is Butch, Lockport Butch from New York. I've been at Deakman's University for two days. Now let me tell you, my head's spinning. Now before I get started, Hello, my name is Butch, Lockport Butch from New York. I've been at Deakman's University for two days. Let me tell you, my head's spinning. Now, before Deakman gets started, I think you ought to know a little bit something about him. First of all, Deakman's... Deakman's a little different. Take, for example, the way he uses numbers. First of all, he thinks speaking in terms of thousandths of an inch, not in terms of decimals or fractions. So when he says 500, he means one half of an inch. He won't say 500 thousandths, just 500. No decimal, no fractions. 625 is 5 eighths of an inch. 750 is 3 quarters of an inch. 875 is 7 eighths of an inch. 1,000 is 1 inch. 1250 is one inch and one quarter. 1375 is one and three eighths and so on. But then like I said, he's a little different. Well, let's put him to work. I mean, that's why you bought the tapes in the first place, isn't it? <sighs> Lockport Butch, huh? How about Lockjaw Butch? Actually, the only thing I've got right here is the thing you really need to build cues is a nice cat. Other than that, you can pretty much toss your axes away, toss your chainsaws away, get rid of all this stuff. Although, I do have to say that 10 years ago when I moved into this place, I cut these few trees down. This is Michigan ironwood and they've been air drying now for 10 years. And I am hoping to get a few little small pieces out of it, but um, it's not the way to start. And so before we start, we're going to tell you a few things. We're going to lecture you here. First of all, these tapes are going to follow a certain progression. I am not going to teach you how to become how to be, how to make cues. I, I am not a cue maker. I am a cue builder. Now that is a pretty fine distinction, I'll grant you, but I have to ask you, did the Egyptians make the pyramids or did they build them? They built them, I believe. And cue building is different than cue making. Cue building is a one-man operation. One man takes it from beginning to end, from tree to the cue, if you would. Um, cue making, well, we're talking about manufacturing. Now, maybe someday you'll get into manufacturing, but I think you're getting these tapes because you want to become a cue builder. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about doing. Now, one of the first things you have to do is go to my internet site and download this book with all these pictures and all these texts in it. Okay, it's free for you. That's at www.cumaker.com. Now, even though I'm not a cue maker, that's my website, cumaker.com, C-U-E-M-A-K-E-R.
www.thinkingmind.com. And you can download this book. Um, we'll be referring to it a lot. Uh, there are pictures and things here. And I'm, one of the assumptions of this tape is that you've read this book and you've studied it. For example, you understand completely Dietman's laws of Q-building. And let me go over them right now. Dietman's first law of Q-building. You must have patience, patience, and then sometimes even more patience. Dietman's second law of Q-building. Do not quit your real job in order to build Qs. Dietman's third law of Q-building. Violation of the first law will always result in you having to do more work down the line. Dietman's fourth law of Q-building. Better always to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Dietman's fifth law of Q-building. You can never buy a machine that is too big, too heavy, or too rusty for building cubes. And the sixth law of Q-building is never, ever give a cue to anyone, even your dear sweet mother, before the bank has cleared her check and you have the funds safely on deposit. But that's a long way down the line because right now, my first question to you is, do you know how to put a tip on it? Because if you don't, why are you thinking about building cubes? Let me digress for one moment here. Let me say to you, if you are watching this alone, and you have a wife and children, or you have a girlfriend, or a significant other, or whatever, do not watch this tape alone. You must, if you have a wife and children, bring them into the room and have them watch it with you. I promise, because I know from past experience, small children enjoy these tapes that I will not curse, swear, or act too violently so it is safe for them. But you cannot watch this tape alone. You must have your significant others watching with you. Um, you may certainly invite friends to watch this tape if you think they might enjoy it. The one thing I don't want you to do with this tape is make copies of it and give it to people. You may, of course, sell this tape to someone else if you want, but do not make copies of it and give it away even to your dear, sweet mother. Back to how to become a Q-Builder. As I said, the first thing you have to learn to do is to put tips on, and that is in a moment or two what we were going to start discussing and showing you some various ways to do it. Once you have learned how to put tips on, then you should go into the repair business and put tips on for other people charging a minimum of $10 for each tip, and perhaps even more, depending on the tips. Um, put this money aside, and sooner or later, you're going to be able to start your river of wood and start buying machinery. Now, to put tips on, you do not need any machines, although you will find that they are helpful. And again, we were going to be going into this in just a little bit. But, so these tapes are going to take you into progression. We're going to talk about tips, then we're going to talk about putting a ferrule on, a ferrule and a tip, obviously. Um, we'll be talking about joint work, various kinds of joints you can put in a queue, because that is your next step. Once you've started putting on tips and getting paid for doing it, then you might consider making sneaky peats, buying a couple of dozen house cues, cutting them in half practicing doing your joint work. Again, if you can't put a good, true, centered, straight joint pin in a house cube, why are you thinking of building cubes? There is a progression. There are steps that you have to pass. Tips and ferrules. Tips first, then tips and ferrules, then joint work. Now we'll talk about finishing and wraps and things like this. We are not going to, in these tapes, get into any 
particular discussion of making cues fancy because you're not going to be ready to do that for at least three or four years probably and it, when you are then you come visit me spend 10 days in my shop at the Q University as it were and we'll take you through that whole process of the fanciness. Fanciness cannot really be shown on videotapes. Now tips are kind of like cats. Nowadays they come in a million different sizes, shapes, colors, flavors. But a uh, long time ago, 1970, when I started doing tips, there was only a half a dozen different kinds available. And the kind that I bought back then for $12 a box for 50 is now about $15 a box, and they're the ones I still use. So has that been progress or not? I don't know. I may be just an old stick in the mud. I mean, now you can get pig skin, you can get horse skin, you can get leather, you can get Vietnamese water buffalo, you can get layered tips, you can get this, that. you can spend twenty dollars for one tip. All right? Now, when a guy says to you, well what kind of tip should I play with? You can't tell him the answer to that. If he can't tell you what kind of tip he wants, forget it. Put on the cheapest, hardest, tip you can get him, get him, the cheapest, hardest tip you can get him, and go from there. If he doesn't remonstrate with you about your choice of tips, then you're fine. All right? And if he wants something more, then you can get him more, but it's going to cost him more. And again, a tip you should pay, you should get no less, no less than $10 for every tip you put on, I don't care, especially if that's one of those cheap tips I'm talking about. Now you're talking about putting on a tip that costs two or three dollars. All right, you better get fifteen or twenty bucks. And so now you're talking about one of these twenty-dollar tips. Well, you better get fifty dollars for this tip. All right, otherwise you're going to lose money. All right, and if you don't lose money, then you can't buy machinery and you can't buy wood. Then you're just a hobbyist. Okay, so tips. Um, Here's a cue. Guy's going to bring this to you. All right? Look at this thing. I think you can see this. Look at this. Is this thing straight? I don't think so. This says NASCAR on it. All right? This isn't even a maple shaft. It's bamboo. Get out of here. You tell the guy that brings that cue in, get out of here. All right? He's going to pay more for the tip than the cue is worth. All right? Now here's a kind of raggedy you, old, straight, the guy loves it, okay, he wants a new tip on it. Well, what are you going to do? Well, first of all, you got to pop the old one. All right, now this one, this is worth it to you. Even if you're going to put on a tip that's $50, one of these layered tips or something like that. Okay, now you're in business. All right, now here's a cue. We're going to do a little bit of work on this here and there. You can see this thing is, uh, um, this is not meant to come apart. Okay. We'll show you some close-ups of this later on down the shop. This, I'll show you, this is a criminal way to build a cube. All right, but anyway, it comes apart and that's not supposed to happen. Um, the rear back here, you may not see, but you, we can just turn all these rings all around, all over the place. Uh, it, you'll see this claw a little bit, this cue a little bit closer up. At any rate, the key to putting on a good tip is two flat surfaces. All right, now here is a tip. All right, here is a piece of glass. Here is some sandpaper, and I'm going to. Pair the back of this tip by moving it in a circular motion. And I've taken the shine off of it. 
and I can see by looking at it, I've got it perfectly flat. Okay, that's your one perfect flat surface. The other perfectly flat surface you have to get is the end of the ferrule. Now, there are many ways to do this. All right, in the beginning, I just took this thing, right, which I bought from a friend of mine, Carl Conlon, in 1970. And you put this on here. This has a little file that goes in here. You put the uh, close the collet down. And you just turn this like this. And you get a flat surface. Isn't that amazing? Now, there are other devices you might buy out that are commercially available. Um, cost you 20 bucks to 250 bucks. Right? And this is how you do hand tips. But now let's put this thing on. This is simplicity itself. Right? We have our flat surface here, totally flat, and we have our totally flat surface here. And we're going to put Well, on this one, we're going to use some super glue because we don't know what kind of material this is. All right? If you're dealing with a ferrule that's made out of fiber, if you're dealing with a material that's made out of ivory in three or Aegeus, some sort of phenolic, or if you're dealing with an ivory ferrule, then I would recommend just using plain old woodworkers yellow glue. However, this is an unidentified plastic, so I'm going to use super glue. And this is a very thick gel super glue. I'm going to spread it on. Make sure it you spread it all over the tip. Okay, now I would recommend you buy your super glue, not in your hardware store in the little tubes, but in bottles like this. This is a half inch, half inch, half ounce bottle. Uh, it can come in two ounce bottles, but the very thick gel. Okay, now we're just going to put this on here. Smooth it around so we get super glue on the ferrule. And we're just going to take a rubber band here and stretch it. Now we want to center this as well as we can. This is oversized. You want to put your tips on oversized and then bring them down to the size of the ferrule, which will cause you some problems in the beginning. All right, if you're really a retentive type person, you could put on oh, two of these. Now here we have one that we glued on earlier, and it overhangs. And what we're going to do is with a razor knife, okay, just a razor knife, this is a box cutter from 911 uh, type knife, um, very sharp. We always use a new blade. We're just going to put this here and start. that is not parallel to the ferrule, but actually points a little bit. And that's what we want. And now we can just simply take some sandpaper. Finish this off, and we can take a file. And again, we're careful not to get the ferrule. Might 
put a little water on it. Polish it up a little bit, and then of course we want to shape it. All right, and that's really all there is. Now, I did it that way for years on my own. Well, for a couple of years, and I mean, as soon as I started out, I started putting on tips for other people. Okay, way back in 1971 at $10 a pop, all right, because your average player can't do it, all right? You put on 200 tips with $10 a pop, that's $2,000 you have in your pocket. Except you put it in a coffee can, you buried it out in the backyard, and when you get it up to about two or $3,000, then you can start buying some wood, you can start buying some machine. all right? Now, after I'd done a few tips, that way, I discovered maybe a little way under power would be better. All right? And I built this kind of funny looking thing here. This has got a pillow block. There's a bearing in here. Uh, I've got a couple of layers of masking tape around the uh, shaft here to steady it. And now to work the tip down under power, you can take the same razor knife. shaving the ferrule too, all right? Incidentally, this uh, uh, machine here, you notice, you can, if you wanted to, you could use this to clean shafts with. This is a little woodworking lathe that cost about $150. And, uh, the modifications took me about 10 hours worth of time and another $20 worth of materials. But now we can at least powder shafts too. Okay? Because this thing can hook up. But now look at this shaft. Can you see this shaft? Oh, this is a fine shaft, let me tell you. It ain't even close to straight. But we can come in here with our sandpaper. Take this up, polish it up for it, put wax, whatever you want on it, right? All right, tips are very individual, and if the player that is coming to you to put a tip on, cannot tell you what kind of tip he wants. That is, I want a medium higher than later tip. I want brand X or brand Y. I want water buffalo as opposed to pigskin. All right, then again, put the cheapest tip you have available on there. 
and make it as hard as you possibly can, then he will give you feedback. When I use the word he, I'm also including all women in this. When I say he, I also mean she. Excuse me. As I said, cats come in all possible shapes and sizes, just like tips do. You notice this one has, their ears are bald. She's bald-headed. Look at this, bald ears. What do you want? She's telling me, I could have done that tip quicker than you did. All right? All right, so this is where you start. You want to become a cue builder? Learn to put tips on. All right? Start by putting tips on your own cue. Every time you go out to play, take your old tip off and put a new tip on. Okay? Practice on yourself. And if within a couple of months you can't start practicing on other people, charging them $10 a pop to practice, okay? Then why are you thinking about building cues? Okay? You're in yaya land. Okay? If you can't put a good tip on, I mean, if you put, can't put a tip on good, it doesn't matter what kind it is, all right? Let me tell you a story. Years and years ago, I got a chance to speak to the great one, Raymond Coulomans, who most of you pool players have never heard of. All right? But at any rate, Raymond Coulomans, who is now in the BCA Hall of Fame for his play, I said, Ray, Ray, tell me. What? I'm a cue builder, right? I said, Ray, what's the most important thing about a cue? Now, this guy is the greatest cue artist in the world, even though you pool players have never heard of him. Raymond Coulomans. Right? And Coulomans tells me, Dennis, you put a good tip on a cue for me, you put it on a broomstick, I will beat anybody in the world. All right, so he's, what he's telling me is the cue don't make any difference. All right, but the tip is the most important thing. And if you can't master tip work, okay, if you can't master tip work, don't think about going any further. If you can, all right, and you start doing tips as a repair person, and the first thing you have to be, remember, okay, in your step to becoming a cue builder, your first step is doing tips for yourself, and your second step is now out there doing tips in the field for people at $10 a pop minimum, all right? And you, every time you get that $10 bill, all right? You take that $10 bill, okay? You put it, you put it in a little coffee can, all right? And when you've got 200 or 300 of those $10 bills in there, you take that coffee can and now you go out and start thinking about buying some machinery and wood. Right. And we're going to talk a little bit about the wood next, okay? Because if you don't know wood, um, I mean, how can you be, be a cue builder if you don't know wood, right? So we're going to talk about that, and, uh, and then we're going to go down and do a little feral work after we've talked about wood. Good. Good. Okay. Now here's just a few of the things you've seen. This is this finished 
uh, tip on there that you saw. Uh, how quickly it took me to do that. Ten dollars a piece. Okay. Um, here's this NASCAR cue that I tossed away. And you might notice when I tossed it, um, this wonderful Ramon wood shaft. Wonderful. Broke. Um, very thin super glue. Two ounce bottle. About ten dollars. Very thick super glue. Half ounce bottle. Oh, well, I don't know. Six, eight dollars. Here's some tight bond two woodworkers glue. Uh, buy this. Here's your box cutters. Okay. Remember, snap these off. If you're if you're doing that tip by shaving it, you need a very sharp razor blade, and every time you've used a blade, snap it off and use a new one for each one. File, duh. This little thing, kind of neat collet holder. Like I say, there's a number of these things on the market you can buy just for doing tips. Uh, sandpaper, rubber band. Do I really need to show you this? Okay, here's the uh, Well, it's kind of upside down here, but this is called a pillow block. There's a bearing in here that moves. I think you can see that move and see how I've set it up uh, so I can put it on the lathe. Okay, to steady it. Okay, and now we're going to talk about wood. Okay, this is a piece of five quarter. 1250, okay, rough cut bird's eye maple. I think you can see the how rough it is, all right? This is why they call it rough cut. Most Q builders don't deal in rough cut wood. They buy their wood in squares. And this is a square of Coca Bolo, for example. And I think you can see this square. It's perfectly smooth and perfectly 90 degrees all the way around. Well, you paid too much for this. All right? You don't need finished surfaces on your wood. Rough cut will do. All right? This piece here, some bird's eye maple. Here's some hard maple for a shaft wood. They look like they're They look like they're they look like they've been uh, surfaced on four sides, but these are really just saw cuts. All right. Um, now I have maple like this that's available for you uh, if you want to buy some wood for me to fool around with. We can get you into some nice wood. Uh, uh, at a fairly reasonable price, depending on uh, how advanced you are, so call me on this. But now, let me back off a little bit and show you what a river of wood looks like. All right? And again, this is how you really want to buy it. You want to buy it in this rough cut form. Now, this is a part of a, this is about 18 inches long, okay? say it's very rough cut you can say that you can see the saw marks here on the edge uh, this is called you buy your rough cut lumber they'll sell it to you in four quarter four slash four five quarter that's five slash four six quarter six slash four or eight quarter eight slash four that means this is five quarter that was means it was nominally 1.25 inches in thickness, and actually this is about 1.3 inches in thickness, so it's a little thicker than it, than it actually says, and from that, that's all you need, right? You just cut this up in squares and turn it round, okay? You don't even need a fancy lathe. You saw me turning earlier that uh, piece of ironwood, all right? Buy you a bunch of logs. Uh, buy you a bunch of boards like this, out of the lengths. Cut them to squares, 
turn them to rounds by hand. You've got your river of wood going. Now let me back off a little bit and we'll show you what a river of wood looks like. Now this is a cat. And this is a river of wood. Now, I once read some manufacturer saying that, oh, it takes us two years to go from the boards to the queue. This is shaft wood. It's been here for four years now. And it's still boards, 32 inches long. All right? You can have all the machinery in the world, but if you don't know wood, and if you don't have good wood, if you don't treat it properly, I'm not sure how your cues will come out. Now, there's some people that will argue with me that I take too long, but I have been doing this for so many years I, and every year, I go out into the field, and every one of these boards here, this is some Purple Heart that was bought uh, five years ago. It was eight quarter thick by six to 12 inches wide by eight to 16 feet long, all right, and every board Every piece you see here came back as one of those boards and over the years I've cut it up a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, until it's here and next year this will be a whole bunch of butterfly butts, for example. All right. Every year I go out in the field and personally examine every board that I buy. I don't do mail order wood. All right. There's a principle in the wood business. All right. If you buy mail order wood, the farther you are away from your source of mail order wood, the worse it's going to be. All right? You want to be able to find a place that will allow you to go through boards, look at the boards, and pick them out. You just don't want to go someplace and say, give me 10 board feet of this, because they'll give you whatever they got laying on top. All right? And the stuff on top may not be, you know, the, the, the good piece might be two layers down, all right? So you've got to be able to paw through your wood, all right? Every year go, I go out and I buy wood. Wood that I'm not going to use in the queue, the finished product, for anywhere from five to ten years. As I say, this Purple Heart, this Wenji here, this is five years old. All right? Just next summer I'm going to start processing it. Uh, this is shaft wood. Okay? Here's more shaft wood. All of this here is birds on a maple. You'll notice how it's st set up. It's stickered. All right? This has been cut into squares on the table saw and set up. And there's little pieces of wood in between it. So air circulates all around it. Okay? We want this stuff cured. All right? The river of wood every year, if you're going to make it, all right, I make 20 cues a year, 30 cues a year. Okay? Maybe 20 cues a year I, I make because people want me to, and the other 10 I do on speculation, design experiments, uh, construction experiments. I'm, I'm still experimenting after all these years. All right? But every year I go out and I buy two times, three times the amount of wood that I'm going to be using. So I'm continually adding to my river of wood. It gets bigger and bigger and flows slowly and more slowly. The shaft wood that I'm sending out with my cues this year is 13, 14, 15 years out of the tree. Okay, now I have the luxury of doing this because I've been 
doing it for so long. Okay? You cannot lose money by buying wood. All right? So this is the river of wood. For example, the shaft wood here. Okay, I buy this in four quarter rough cut hard maple boards, every one of which I have examined before I buy it. And I probably examine, for every ten boards I examine, I maybe pick out one, and the rest I discard. All right, these boards come back to the shop and I'll show you them. I buy them in the spring all right, for maple, just talking about shaft wood. I buy four quarter rough cut boards of maple in the spring. Now, when they log off hard maple, which is sugar maple, they log it in the dead of winter when it's below freezing. The sap is in the ground. All right, the tree is as dry as it's going to be. So if I buy this maple in the spring, I know that it's at least a year old. All right, if I buy it in September, August, uh, October, November, it could have been cut last winter. All right, so I always go out in the spring and buy it. And it comes in, and I'll show you, uh, eight foot boards, 12 foot boards, and it sits there for one year in those boards. One year later, I cut it up into these lengths. 32 inches is my optimum. For shafts or longer if possible. Right? That's the second year. The third year we'll cut it up into squares. The fourth year we'll take the edges off, make octagons out of these and start turning them. Or I may wait for a couple of more years. All right? These squares right here were bought about six years ago and they're still squares. All right, when we take you down in the shop, you will see all sorts of stuff hanging. All right, again, this is a river of wood that flows through my shop. And you should start your river of wood first. So many guys go out and buy machinery. And once they've got the machinery, they go, oh, I should get some wood and make some cues. So they go out and buy some wood, and right away, within a year, they've made a cue. Three, ten cues, twenty cues, fifty cues out of this wood they've just bought. That's too quick. That's too soon. If you're going to go it that way, okay? I mean, if you want to get started making cues right away, then you need to deal with the people down in Oklahoma, the Prather people, okay? Because they'll machine you parts and things out of wood they've had around for a while, all right? And you work with Prathers for the first two or three years of your cue building existence while you're buying your wood, okay, and taking it in rough cut form. You don't even really need a good lathe, all right? That lathe that you saw me turning down on, you could, I could take these squares right here, put them in there, and turn them to rounds, okay? I could go from squares to rounds without any sophisticated machinery at all, just hand turning. My river of wood starts, okay, and it flows. All right, and the boards that comprise your cues, you should be buying five to ten years before those cues finally come out. Now, I know in the beginning you're going to be impatient, and like I say, if you're impatient, then call up Prathers down in Oklahoma. They're a nice family operation. They'll do just about anything you want them to do, and uh, you want to get a hold of them. Wait till the end of the tape, and you'll see their phone number and all their contact things and everything else. But now let's look at this river of wood. Let's go through it. And I'll give you some close-ups of it and give you a little, a little more feel of what's going on here. This is shaft wood. The colors on the end are merely my codes to let me know when I bought it, where it came from. Okay. There's boards. Here are some squares. I think you can see they don't rest on each other. We're allowing air to circulate all around them. Uh, here are some thin veneer strips I have made. More shaft wood here. 
Here's the eight quarter purple heart, the eight quarter Wenji. There's a tool chest. This is all bird's eye maple. Okay, you see the marks on the ends. Those are codes, they tell me what the wood is, how old it is. And again, they're stickered. Those little pieces of wood in between, you see how they're separated? This is how you need to store your wood. All right, this bird's eye right here is six, seven years old, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, here's a nice bandsaw. Uh, you're going to use that. Again, you'll the, all these tools, uh, here's the uh, sander. Here's a bunch of small scraps of wood that I use for inlays. All sorts of fancy wood up in there. Uh, here you see up on the top, that's some four-quarter hard maple and boards. That stuff I bought this spring. It's not going to be 15 years before this comes out as shaft wood. All right? There's stuff hanging up there. Um, here we have all sorts of bird's eye shorts. All variously color coded to let me know what's going on with it, how old it is, all sorts of things. Um, Here's a little setup we have on an old lathe here. This is where we cut our points, okay, for pointed fronts. Now this is something you're not going to see in this tape, but you want to come to the university and work on this machine and build pointed fronts? Well, come on. We'll do it. Here's more, mate. Goodness sakes, look at all this stuff. Here's some more wood. Look at this in boards. All right. This is a river of wood. And you need, as a cue builder, to start your river of wood tomorrow. All right. Now you've had You've been building, you've been putting tips on it, right? All right? You've been getting these $10 bills, all right? And remember, these $10 bills, you don't spend. This is not fun money. This is not fun chips. You take that $10 bill and you put it in a hat or something. And sooner, hopefully, than later, you're going to have a lot of $10 bills there. You start out buying wood, all right? The first cues you should be making, simple bird's eye butts, 29, 30 inches long, all right? Shafts, okay? I can sell you some wood to do these things. It's five, six, seven years old. So you can do them right away. You can call up Prather's in Oklahoma and get parts from them. The, the wood has been cured for a number of years, all right? But you do not want to go out and buy wood and start making cues out of it. All right? You've got to do this a step-by-step -step process. You're doing the tips, you're doing the ferrules, you're doing rewraps, you're doing refinishing, and you're doing this for three, four, five years. And every year you buy enough wood to make 10, 20, 30 cues. All right? And you turn it down by hand if you have to into rough rounds at least. Get it into rounds, okay? Hang it up like all this stuff hangs right here. Let it cure, okay? All right, now, five, five years later, after you started doing tips, now you're ready to do some cues. Now you're ready to get some more sophisticated machinery. Maybe you bought it beforehand. Um, there's lots of stuff out there. Uh, we'll talk about that shortly, but this wood is the most important thing in your cue building life. Buy your wood first. Get out there. 
think about it. Think about what you need. I mean, you can spend a hundred dollars and get enough wood for uh, a dozen cues. Simple bird's eye butts, maple shafts. What more do you need? That's going to hit as good as anything you're going to make. It doesn't have to be fancy to hit good. And I believe that while you ultimately want to make fancy cues, that you ultimately really want to make good hitting cues. You want to make the cue that hits so good it makes you play better than you've ever played before in your life. All right? And if you don't treat your wood well, if you don't treat it nicely, if you don't treat it slowly, move it along slowly, put it in a river of wood and let it flow very slowly out to the finished cue, this is not going to happen for you. So now, I've lectured you enough, I guess, about wood. If you really want to learn to know wood, then you come to the Q University. We'll take you out to these places where I would buy wood. Okay? Bring your pickup truck. We'll go out there and help you select pieces of wood for you to take back and cut up and turn into rounds and slowly but surely let it flow through your river of wood and someday you're going to wake up five years from now, ten years from now, and you're going to be a cue builder. And that's because, first of all, you haven't violated Diekman's second law of cue building. You haven't quit your real job. Right? You've been doing this on the side. All right? And this is what you have to do. All right? Slowly but surely, Diekman's first law, patience, patience, and then have more patience. All right? If you're not a patient person, you will not become a cue builder. And one of the things a patient person does is buys wood and sets it up and stores it and works it very, very slowly. And let's go down and put a ferrule on a cue. Because now, you ought to be able to get 20 to 30 bucks for that because you're going to need a tip also on it. And now you're making real money to put it in that coffee can, in that hat. All right? And now, after that, you'll be able to buy some machinery. This is the snuffy cat. I have to apologize for its rude behavior in one of the lectures where it sneezed and ate its snot, but then that's why we call it the snuffy cat. This is why I insist that you and your significant other and your offspring, should you have any, watch this tape together. Because this is what your life will become, see. They have to understand that by buying this tape from Diekman, the alleged cue builder, that your life will change and change radically, hopefully for the best. But your significant other and your offspring may have to go some through some serious changes. Now this is what the house looks like. There's the cornfields to the north. This is the Q University. There's uh, the house. There's the car. There's a cat sitting there, a curious cat trying to get killed on the road. And if you notice right down from the house 
that is actually the main academic building of the university and that's where all the work is done however you can see and this is significant others should pay close attention to this because there is where that river of wood is you see it it's in the garage and so your life will change because now significant other will not have a place to park their car because the garage has become the primary wood processing area and let's just for a moment take a little walk up there and see what we can see again cats are necessary for building cubes This is what your life will become if you are the significant other of a cube builder. Excuse me here. Your garage will be taken up by things. As I said, your garage will be taken up by things. Here is a table saw that we do butterflies on. Again, to learn to do butterflies, I'm sorry, you're going to have to be, come to the university. But your significant other is welcome to come also, as long as she'll cook for us. Another saw. That's where the pointy points are cut. Huh? Another cat is on the scene. Oh, remember, cats are necessary for cue building. All right, now let's go into the garage one more time and just look at all these tools again. Again, right here we have a big dust collector. Actually, it's a small dust collector, and it doesn't do very good. A couple of saws, table saws, old ones, you see. To the house. And here is where the river of wood starts. Tool cabinet. My neighbor John Cody going by. Uh, there is a small planer. Another table saw. A large band saw. This is where we've been. Incidentally, that company there. That company there. Great woodworking machinery. Great metalworking machinery. I've got their bandsaw. I've got their sander. You'll see that. The lathe I was doing tips on came from them. I want 10 more machines that they sell. floor model it's a large sander this lathe is normally down in the shop we'll move it down there you'll see it down there cut off saw Another corner of the garage taken up with a river of wood. Significant others and children pay attention to this. A 
Again, notice the separation between all the squares. That is how you store wood correctly. These are the four quarter maple boards that I bought this spring that won't be shafts for about 15 to 20 years. Okay. I'm in no hurry. Deekman's first law. Patience, patience, patience. That wood right there is black walnut, American black walnut. It's been air dried since 1902. I know because I bought it from an auction at an auction in Virginia in 1977. And I bought it from the guy whose grandfather had it cut. I make tables and chessboards out of it. I once had about five times as much. This is my setup, how I cut points in the rounds. You will not see this in operation on the tape, but perhaps those of you that have some sort of smarts will be able to figure out what's going on here. The only thing I'll tell you is there's two angles you've got to make. Okay? Two angles you have to make, and they both have to be equal to each other. And what they are, I don't know two or three degrees at the most. Back view of an old table saw. Back view of another old table saw. Most of my cues are built on table saws. I can do four point cues using just a table saw. Butterflies, this is where it's at. And again, for the significant other, this is what it's going to look like in your life from now on. Your car will not be parked in the garage. It will be outside if your significant other starts building cues. That is why you must continue to watch this tape. Now there's the garage where we've been for the last God knows how many minutes of this tape and here we come down the path and we come in to the shop. And we just might look around out here. And, oh my goodness. That's one of my cue building helpers. And there might be even some others around. Oh my goodness. It's hiding. And coming down the hill to help us work in the shop is Ducey. So let's go in and see what's inside. And here we're in the front side door. Several cats going in and out, as you see. Again, cats are important for cue making. We're about three feet in, and as we go here, we see a tool chest, some things. Uh, Oh my, what do we have here? Those are pieces for four feet, four 
point fronts that have been cut on the table saw. And proceeding towards the south, here is a milling machine with a jig set up in it to do certain things. Here is some of that 10 year old ironwood. Here is a little tiny lathe that is set up to do one operation. It's a robot. There's a jig I have built. It takes me 10 seconds to put it up on the uh, milling machine and we're ready to cut slots for ring work, chain work, window work whatever you want to call it. Shelves of various supplies in it, 200 amp service panel, hardly used, cues on the way to finishing, shafts, cues, This is the Atlas. You'll see me working on it. It's a bunch of sandpaper storage right in the middle. Well, some Q rack there, and oh, what do we have? Looks like a Q building cat to me. And she's on a vertical, excuse me, a horizontal milling machine that uh, someday I might get to work to do me something for Q building. There are a bunch of shafts. There is my first lathe, the Logan. You'll see me work on it. There beyond the Logan, I think you see a few future cues lined up. You can't see it, but right over the headstock of the Logan, we'll show you in a moment, is the Panagraph machine. Lots more wood hanging. I think you'll see we're coming around here. More wood. More wood hanging. A little furnace. Some more future cues. Here's ring work central. Right here, close up to us. Here's 
the big old Dimco. And once again, you need cats. Oh, you need cats to be a Q builder. Just to orient you again, here is the door, and there is the Dimco. It's the milling machine. There's that little tiny lathe you saw. There's part of the atlas. There's the Logan, where we do a lot of work. Again, the Dimco. This is my turning center. A very fine old South Bend lathe. We'll see that in operation later. There's Order Central. Those are all the orders I have on right now. Not that many. Lots of cues hanging up there. Oh. Good cats help you make good cues. A lot of more shafts are down there. Now you've seen all this before. Um, Victor Stein, pay attention. These cues that are finally going to get showing up here that we're going to look on for a while, you're the one that I made these for. You picked out the one, you know which one you picked out. Victor asked me to make him a cue when I first got acquainted with him while he was just starting to work on the billiard encyclopedia. Now it's 14 years later, Vic might get his cue. He even tells me that uh, it has kept him alive all these years. And when he gets it, he tells me he might even die. So to keep him from dying, I'm telling tell him, Victor, I'm going to make you another cue. 20 years this time, okay? 20 years, maybe keep us both alive. Bob Dylan said that. Victor, I love you. This is the pantograph. This is the pantograph machine. This is the machine that we do all our inlays on. This is the machine you will not really see in operation in these tapes. This is the machine you will get to work on if you decide to come to the university. And that's pretty much the shop tour. Um, there's a friend of mine. There's another friend of mine. There's another friend of mine. This is the workbench. Runs the whole, almost the north side of the shop. Kind of messy now. But then, when isn't it? Ring work central. Very well hung. He's a very well hung cue builder. You know. I suspect you want me to go back to work now. Instead of 
babbling on like I have been for the last Lord knows how many minutes. All right, pay attention now, all right? Remember, you are not watching this tape alone. You have your best friend with you. You have your significant other. You have your spouse and your offspring, if you have any, watching this. They must watch this to know what you are getting into. The fact that you have decided to become a cue builder will impact their lives significantly. And so they must watch this also to see what you are going through. Okay. Now, we're down in the shop now. All right? And as Hulk Hogan said, or whatever that guy's name Hogan was, you know, the alligator guy, the Australian alligator guy, you know, he goes to New York, you know, and he get, meets these bad guys, you know. This guy pulls a knife on him and he says, and then he pulls his knife out and he says, now this is a knife. All right? Remember that lathe we had up in the shop? Okay? This is a lathe. Okay? Now, the first thing you have to learn about lathes is you don't leave the chuck key in here and turn it on. because it could hurt you, all right? But this is a lathe. This lathe I bought in 1978. Actually, it was bought for me by Mr. Ted Norris because I dropped out of law school to go back to run a pool hall. And part of the deal was he buys me this lathe, all right? And I still have this lathe. And you know, 1978, Chris Hightower, the Q man billiards, was not in business, all right? I wish he had been, because I would have bought one of his lathes. All right? And that's what you have to think about. All right? Now, let's recapitulate. Okay? You bought these tapes, and you understand you don't know foo-foo. Right? You can't even put a tip on your own cue. But now it's eight months later, and every day you go out to play, you've been putting a tip on your cue, and you've gotten kind of competent. And so now you feel that you can go out, even though you just have these little hand things, right? And maybe that woodworking lathe up there, you know? That little tiny knife like that guy had, you know, in the movie? This is a knife, all right? any rate, um, and now, after doing that about eight months, all right, now it's now a year later, right? So the last four months, you've actually been out in the field soliciting people to put tips on you know, and for ten dollars a piece, right? And the tip cost you forty cents, and the rest of it's pure profit, how much time you take it, right? And in four months, right, because you're out in the field a little bit, and this is where it's going to impact your spouse and your significant others and your, you know, and, and siblings and, uh, and uh, you know, offspring and things like this, is, is now you're not at home because you're going out soliciting this business, but you get ten tips a week. Okay, for four months. Okay, this is the last four months of the first year of your Q building experience. All right, ten tips a week for four months. That's sixteen weeks. That's sixteen hundred dollars. Okay, remember, ten dollar bill. That's a hundred and sixty ten dollar bills. And you put it in the coffee can. Okay, and you're only a year down the road. Right? And you spent, you know, $150 on that kind of lathe and, uh, you know, a couple hundred dollars on tips and things and, you know, I mean, but you're under, uh, you're under 500 bucks. You should be under 500 bucks. And then you're only, you're a year down the road and you can put tips on. Hey! 95% of the people out there, they're good players out there. They can't put their own tips on. All right? What does that say to you? 
not good. Something missing. All right? Not complete billiard player. All right. So you can put tips on, and it's a year later, and you got uh, 160 of these in here. Because for the last four months, you've done tip, 10 tips a week by hand. All right? Which means your significant other and things haven't seen you too much. But at any rate, now you're thinking of going big time. And you've got a little cash in the pocket. All right? And you've got to get some better machinery. And again, I mentioned Chris Hightower, Q-Man Billiards. Um, at the end of the tape, you'll be able to see how you can contact him and everything like this, but he makes a turnkey Q-building operation. All right? And you can start out with his minimum thing and, uh, and then add on to it. All right? And you don't have to buy a machine like this and scrape the rust off of it. All right? When I bought this machine, this is a Logan. Model B, 1957. This thing is 67, 77, 87, 97. This thing is 45 years old. I think mean, it took me 50 hours at least to get it ready to do build cues. Okay? So, in the beginning, rather than going out and trying to find some of these things, which, and you buy them, Lord knows, you know, what you're getting. All right? Go to Chris down in Missouri. He's a good man. He'll set you up. All right? And I'll guarantee that 20 years after you buy his machine, it'll still be in, it, in your shop. And you'll still be doing things on it. And you probably will have machines like this, okay? Because you finally discovered, remember, one of Dietman's laws of cube building is it can't be heavy enough, uh, solid enough, or rusted enough, you know, to use it. And Christmas, Chris's machine will come to you, you know, pristine, and plus you can call him up and, you know, he'll sell you shaft blanks and things like this. And he's like the Prathers. He's a family operation, right? Chris Hightower, the Prathers, they're family operations. Uh, there's a guy I'll tell you about, David Warther. You know, if you wanted to get to Ivory, I'll talk to you about David Warther later on. You know, these are people that I know that you can buy products from, which I don't hesitate to recommend. But at any rate, so you're watching this tape with your significant other, his or her, her or whoever it is, and their, his or her, their offspring. And what's going to happen in the rest of these tapes is we're going to solve like two problems, all right? And again, you've been in this now, it's a year after you got the tapes and you've been putting on tips on it. All right, and that's all you've been doing. But now you want to expand, you know? You really, you get, you've really got the cue builder itch now, all right? And so now it's time to start practicing on some others. And there's a couple of ways to do it. All right? And we're going to solve two problems in the rest of this, this video here uh, that you're going to encounter. And that's going to take you up till your fifth year of cue building or so. All right? And again, during this time now, because you've got those ten dollar bills, you know, that have been coming in. Now you're now you're talking about your fifth year, right? Remember? The last four months of your first year, you did ten dollars, you did ten tips a week. Alright? Now for the next four years, up to your fifth year, you're gonna do ten tips a week. Alright? That's five hundred and twenty tips a year. That's twenty thousand dollars in the next four years. Alright, now if you can't you know, a Ford machine, you know, forget it, okay? You understand what's happening, all right? What I'm trying to tell you, all right? Put this money, this is not to go to Aruba, um, all right? This is not to go gambling in Windsor, you know, all right? This is to buy wood. This money is to buy wood, right? Get your river of wood flowing and buy your machines. And the first machine you buy is Chris's, all right? So, now you buy Chris's machine and the guy comes to you and he says, I got this problem, all right? First of all, here's this NASCAR cue. Remember that NASCAR cue? Remember we showed you the, what happened to the thing and the wrap on this thing? Look at this. The wrap is, is coming off. And so you've got to learn to develop the cue builder's attitude, all right? And so the guy brings this cue in and you say to him, well, you know, he comes in and he says, I broke the shaft. You know, can you build me a new shaft for this thing? 
and 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 maybe fix the wrap on this and uh, and you say to him well sir I believe this cube is worthless as it is right correct totally worthless and he goes well yeah the wrap screwed up and, and, and there's no shaft on it and and yeah it's worthless As a cube builder, you say, son, let me make you a better cube. I have this house cube here that I just cut in half, and I'm going to make a nice cube out of that. And I'll charge you a mere $225 to do this, and you'll really have a nice weapon. Give me $100 right now. So you're serious, and I'm serious. And come back in two months, and this cue is yours. Okay? So that's what one of the things we're going to do. We're going to build this cue for that guy. Now, the other thing that's going to happen to you, I mean, we're going to do some work on it, so it's all right. The next thing that's going to happen to you is somebody's going to bring in a cue like this. And they're going to say to you, My granddaddy, he bought this cue during the Korean War, and it is a ap antique, and I, you know, he played with this, he swore by it, and he, he died recently, and I'd like, it's kind of in kind of crummy shape, I'd like to get it fixed up, I think it's, it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> up here. Look at this. Look at this. It comes apart. It's broken in the middle. Look. Look. But this is his granddaddy's antique. And this is where you're going to have to learn whether you're a cue builder or not, or a cue maker. At first, you're going to have to be a cue maker, I guess. Right? Because you have to swallow your pride and say, oh. I think it is a really uh, nice, yes, quality antique. Yes, it should have a lot of value, especially after I have made it, turned it back into pristine condition. Oh Lord, take me now. I have lied so sinfully. All right, but all right, if you can agree to this guy to spend $300 to fix this queue up, then it's probably worth it. All right, and we're going to fix this queue up in front of your house. Look at this. Oh, this is really ugly, ugly. Now, I'm going to turn this lathe on and give you a close-up so you can see exactly what we might have going here. But, so this is the second thing we're going to show you, how to do a repair on an irreparable cube. All right, and that's all we're going to show you. All right, you'll notice this cube has got points in it with like one, two, three veneers. Uh, one, two, three, four veneers. Excuse me. They're colored plastic. Um, I'm probably going to have to re-glue them. I mean, you're going to see all sorts of horror shows here doing this cue. And, of course, the, uh, the Hustler cue, the house cue cut in half, Sneaky Pete. Um, you know, you tell the guy, hey, yeah, bring me a cue. Bring me your favorite house cue. I'll cut it in half, put a joint in. You know, you know that's 75 bucks right there, right? Now, you're going to take a cue and do it like I'm going to do on this one. It's about two and a quarter, all right? And, and this is on top of the $10 you're going to get for every tip you put on, all right? And as we do this, we're going to show you some feral stuff. And, then, you know, we're going to be refinishing this and putting finish on it and wraps and, and joint work and all sorts of stuff. And that's where we're going to leave you at the end of these tapes. You want to learn how to construct a cue like this? 
four points with veneers in it, uh, things like that. Now you got to come to the shop. You've got to come and, and spend some time and spend some money and visit the Q University. And believe me, I'll put you to work in a hands-on experience on all these machines you've seen, or just the ones you want to work on. Uh, each program, each individual who comes here, it's an individualized program. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, I guess that's a little plug for the university there. But so, the rest of this tape is we're going to resurrect this cube, and we're going to make this house cube into a $225 item. And you've spent $15 on this, all right? Now, either the guy brings this butt into you, all right? you got two things going. Remember, you've got an attitude. You are the cue builder. You are the doctor. He is the one who has a, have the sights, or his cue, all right? So don't let him argue with you, all right? And he either brings you a house cue, which you cut in half and finish off for him, or you go to your local bar stool and billiards place or something like that and where they've got two or three four hundred house cues sitting there and you go through them all right and you may spend fifteen twenty dollars on one you know uh, buying it this way but you go through them and you reject 99 percent of the ones that you go through but spend an hour or two there and you'll come up with half a dozen good house cues that you can turn in to something you paid twenty dollars for, something you can sell for two hundred dollars for. And you're going to watch me make that transformation here shortly. Again, as well as <laughs> reconstructing this thing, if at all possible. I mean, this this could this is going to be a horror show. All right, I don't know what's going to happen with this. This has been sitting around in the shop for sixteen years. I mean, someone brought this in sixteen years ago, and that's uh, you know. At any rate, so that's what you're going to see in the rest of these tapes. So get your family together, get your significant other, get your offspring together, uh, get some popcorn going, and uh, sit down and enjoy this. And take notes, okay? You must take notes on this. You must must watch these tapes at least a half a dozen times before you call me up with stupid questions. All right? Not that there are ever any stupid questions, all right? but if you watch this tape once and call me up with questions, I will know it because all the questions will be answered after this. Yeah. 90% of them, all right? but you have to watch it about six times because you are in, getting into information overload. And this is again, let your spouse watch this with, me, with you. So when you go down to the shop, she can say, oh honey, didn't he say to do that in the tape? And you go, oh, by God, he did. Thank you, dear. And she'll love you even more for that. All right. Give me a few minutes and done. Uh... Now I do want to just show you what this cue that we're going to reconstruct looks like. Remember this is the cue his grandfather bought it in Korea while he was over there serving in the war and uh, played with it for years and then he died, you know, and now the kid's got it and he wants it resurrected. All right? You got to work with this. But look at that. Look at what's happened with the plastic out of the rear. Totally come apart. the original shaft. All right? Someone tried to make a good match of it, but it's not the original. They're stainless, and the white and the black ring work is different sizes. So this is not the original shaft. And look at what's happening at the business end. Look at it. Look at the run out there. All right? And I want you to, when I'm done with this key, We'll put this cue on the lathe again, and you can look at it and see what happens. But now look at that. Part of the 
problem there is the ferrule is half cracked, right? And he wants to keep it the same length. All right, so we're gonna have all sorts of problems on this cue. And between that and the Hustler cue we're gonna build, um, you're gonna turn into a cue builder if you pay attention to what I say. All right? So now, let's get to work on these two beauties. Now before we get started on these cues, I want to show you two operations because this is something you need to know. Uh, a lot of cues are joined together like this. Uh, you'll put collars on. And you see how these two pieces fit together? This is called a tenon and this is called a mortise. This is a blind mortise because it doesn't go all the way through. And we have also, you might call this a through mortise. All right. um, this is not a piece of plastic with a hole in it. It's a piece of plastic with a mortise in it. And you must know how to cut these. Um, you'll cut various sizes from anywhere from uh, 300 thousandths to uh, eight, nine hundred thousandths of uh, an inch. And there, it's very important to get this. I'm going to show you. I'm going to cut one tenon. I'm going to cut one mortise. And that's it. And then in the future, I will just tell you I have done this. But this is how it's done. Now, in the normal course of affairs, uh, everything is done very slowly. Um, say I were to cut this to a a size of 800 thousandths. Uh, it's now uh, an inch and 300 thousandths or so. I would take it down slowly. I would take it down to an inch and let it rest for a few weeks and then take it down to 900 and then I would finally take it down to 800. We'll just do this all at once here. Um, see the tool? The tool is kind of a three-way tool. It's designed to cut in this way to give me a perfect face. You can see here that this is what we call a facing operation. We're making this face perfectly perpendicular to the axis of the work. Simply put, to cut a tenon, you simply As I say, uh, I'd cut it down to here, and then uh, next operation I'd cut a little more off, and then would be a third operation to get it to the finished size. Um, it's important that this face here be perpendicular to this, and everything, of course, being right in line with the axis of the work. And let's just take a final cut on this. I'm going to go in, face this. And then under power, the tool will move this way down here, giving me a good surface.
Now, bingo. That's all there is to it. If I'd cut this smaller, I could put a ferrule on. If I'd cut it a little bigger, I could uh, put a, a joint collar on or something like this. Uh, again, this piece here is the rear end of a cue. And the handle will be mortised in it like that. Okay. And that's all there is to cutting a tenon. Okay. Now again, the mortise is simply the hole that the tenon will slide into. And this gives us a lot of gluing surface if when we're going to glue things together. Um, now you're going to see me drill this here. bigger. Now this hole is not finished. All right. Um, let me state here emphatically, it is impossible to drill a hole that is perfectly centered, perfectly round, and perfectly straight. And that is what we must have for our mortise. All right. If we're going to make quality cubes. All right. No matter how centered your tailstock is, no matter how sharp your drills are, no matter how well ground they are, it is impossible to drill a perfect hole. That, again, is perfectly round, is perfectly straight with the axis of the work, and perfectly centered. The only way you can do that is to bore it, and this is a boring bar. They come in all sorts of sizes. Uh, again, information on that. You need to see the uh, pictures of all sorts of ones in the, uh, the book you can download from the Q site. Now, again, I want to face off. <laughs> to the axis. And now we'll go in with our boring bar and make this hole perfect. All right? We drill under size and then bore to whatever size we want. Mortises, one wants to be careful that one doesn't slam the tool to the bottom of the hole because this can snap off. You can see it's sitting out there. It's pretty stiff, but it's still got some flexibility. So we'll kind of go in pecking a little bit. We turn the tool in about 10 thousandths of an inch every time. pass, we'll draw the boring bar out under power.
burrs off of it. And now we do in fact have a hole that is perfectly round, perfectly centered in this piece, assuming that the piece was centered in the chuck, of course, perfectly straight with the axis, and we have a face that is perpendicular to the bore. And now we can join something with that. So this is a mortise. You've seen it. You've seen the tenon. And in the future parts of this tape, uh, I'll show you mortises I've cut, tenons that I've cut, but you won't see me actually cut them anymore. Once you've seen me cut one, you've seen me cut them all. And again, it's just a matter of size. You'll be uh, doing mortises from as small as uh, 310, 315 for your ferrules, uh, all the way up to maybe even an inch in diameter, even larger for to slip on plastic sleeves and collars. Okay, but that's all there is to it. Uh, it must be bored. It must be bored. you another angle, and this is the easy way to do it. Actually, this is the criminal way to do it. All right, look at how sharp that tool is. See that ribbon of wood coming off? All right, if you were to touch that tenon which is forming, you would feel wetness. Now, even though this is wood at 6% moisture content, there's still enough water in here, and even though that tool is so sharp, it's literally just boiling the water out of this. If this tenon stays straight, I will be extremely surprised. pretty easy and criminal way to bore out a mortise. We're drilling it, we're not boring it. And again, you look at that. You think that hole's round? Give me a break. You think it's straight? Give me a break. Look at it here. This is the ugliest thing I've ever seen. You can't drill it? Perfect. Trust me. to do a hole using a boring bar. And I guarantee you this hole is perfectly straight with the axis of the piece because it, the piece is perfectly centered in the chuck, that it's perfectly round, perfectly centered, and perfectly perfect. And of course we face that face off and it's perfectly perpendicular.